Welcome everyone to our companion discussion on the essay Experiences, the Law of Beings from Julius Evola's Introduction to Magic, Volume 1, which begins on page 167 for those who would like to follow along. Since this is our first foray into the Introduction to Magic books, I want to just first explain what these books are. There are a series of essays published by members of the Ur group, of which Julius Evola was a founding member. They all wrote under pseudonyms, but it's very likely that this particular essay was written by Evola himself. Hopefully you've had a chance to either read this for yourself or listen to the reading, which is linked in the description. We'll be using a few clips from that reading, but I highly recommend that you digest it in its entirety and give yourself space to thoroughly ponder over it. Evola raises an interesting point of concern in this essay, which is born out of his personal experiences, namely the problem of this law of reaction, essentially something very similar to the law of karma that is applying in the supersensible magical domain. He not only shares his personal experiences, observations, and insights with us, but he raises an ethical question for which he admits he has no answer. First of all, he warns the aspiring Magus that there are perils that lie in wait for him at every step of his magical journey. The magical path laid out in this book is very much a humid or wet path, sometimes also called a left-hand path, and so it is a walking of the razor's edge. One wrong step and you could fatally cut yourself. It is not forgiving of errors. We'll explore this topic more in depth in the future because it's important, but for the purposes of this discussion, it's enough to understand that while this path may offer great rewards, it also carries great risk, and for most people, setting out on this path will only lead to their destruction. Let's review this passage to start with. Let me describe some stages of my experience that bear on the present problem. In the case of a man who is freeing himself, something lies in ambush at every step of the way, ready to strike him. First on the mental plane. During the early phases of detachment, what occurs is a halt in the process of cerebration. The mind is immobilized as if stunned. What ensues is a special state that I would like to call a state of clarity or of evidence. This state no longer knows any arguments, concepts, or doubts. In this state, there are no longer problems, but rather a deep-seated real need for knowledge, which is followed by the flash of direct evidence, namely an idea with the character of revelation of peremptory, absolute, and resounding certainty. During these illuminations, my soul remained entirely passive. Eventually, I succeeded in moving it. Then something like a collapse ensued. I experienced the illusion of the previous evidences. I realized that everything could take on such a character of evidence, even opposite truths, as long as the soul, while in that state, wanted it so. It was a frightful moment, but I crossed over the abyss of folly. Here Evola describes the earliest stages of the practice of detachment in which the mind becomes immobilized, making possible what he calls a state of clarity or of evidence. He says in this state the mind no longer knows any arguments or doubts or conceives of any problems that need to be solved with the rational and empirical mind, and that in this state one has what feels like flashes of insight and revelation with a sense of absolute certainty about it. This is one of the first dangers because the mind and soul are passive here. You could probably make a case that this is the state achieved in the majority of cases of psychedelic use. Many of you probably know someone, or maybe you are that someone, who has waxed poetic over the revelations and insights they have received on these drugs, and be utterly convinced of them, certain that they've unlocked the keys to cosmic truth. But these are things that they have received passively in that state, without detachment from craving. So. Maybe they're true, it's possible, but it's also possible that maybe it's just what the soul wishes to be true at a given moment. When we first start practicing detachment, that detachment is rarely perfect, and there is often an underlying desire or a preference for a particular outcome, and often we're not even consciously aware of it. Evola says he finally succeeded in moving his soul out of this sort of paralytic state, and when he did, all of those revelatory experiences collapsed, and with the realization that anything can seem true in that state so long as the soul desires it to be so. 
And he described this realization as being very disorienting, which of course it would be because all of the things that you had previously considered true and which had been a support all collapses away or become suspect. Let's turn to our next example. The relativity of truth is a philosophical commonplace. As a student of philosophy, I was not in the least impressed by it. There is no possible comparison between this truth, which is a simple intellectual notion, and that experience. The experience generates the feeling of an absolute lack of firm ground, a feeling of falling and an icy, deadly sense of isolation. I felt myself to be on the verge of falling apart and dissolving in the blind chaos of incoherence. What saved me was a sort of sacrilegious violence, the daring of an absolute affirmation that reopened the circle. I found again a support, but this support in my case was action itself rather than truth. In order to overcome this abyss of folly, as he calls it, he goes on to say that he turned not to these truths or evidences for support as they were only false supports, but to action as a way to recover the self that was on the brink of dissolution, having had those supports knocked out from under it. This concept of action is also something we'll come back to at another time, but it's a bit outside the scope of the central problem presented in this essay. But in any case, this danger is something that everyone dabbling in metaphysical realms should be aware of as a basic principle. Let me read you the footnote that was included in that passage, bottom of page 169. He says, When, unlike this collaborator, meaning himself, realization comes in the form that is imaginal or visual or emotive intellectual, the phases described correspond to these marvelous figures that are then shown as specters and illusions. Thus, as has been noted, he comes to a state of partial liberation of the subtle or mental body as in a dream. If it is not overcome, this state of evidence has repercussions in normal life as an inclination to superstition, gullibility, and fanaticism. So if you don't ever break out of that passive state through a sheer act of will, you only get this dreamlike, partial liberation of the subtle body, which many people mistake for true liberation. In fact, they are just remaining in this state of evidence, the evidence being those feelings of revelation borne by the cravings of the soul, and this results in a person who has very poor discernment when it comes to spiritual or other matters. And despite their inability to judge what is nonsense from what is not, they are often incredibly dogmatic about their beliefs. I hate to pick on New Agers all the time because a lot of them are nice people who mean well, but this is what comes of, say, drinking too much ayahuasca without having first purified yourself of your sense cravings. And this is why you see a lot of people in that community who are very spiritually sick, despite their endless pursuit of spiritual things. They often stay in that emotive intellectual realm, and they have no real knowledge about how to go beyond that realm, or even that there is anything beyond it. But let's move on to the crux of the matter. The Law of Beings, this essay is subtitled. Beings, in this sense, are presences on the supersensible plane, which Evola describes as sort of the feeling of coming up against a force field. There's something there that your presence on the magical plane is pushing up against. And just like the law of karma generates an effect from a cause, a similar law applies in this realm. If you created a resistance against one of these force field type things, you create an effect, and the effect is that something pushes back. The more resistance you create against this force, the stronger it pushes back with an equal and opposite reaction. The power of that being now turns against the person and pushes back, creating this resistance on whoever acted against it. Let's listen again. It is clear to me that in the world of beings there is a law of necessity comparable to the physical law of action and reaction. When resistance is created against the vortex of a being, the cause of an effect is produced, all the more so in the case of a magical operation. The effect is a reaction, namely a power of the being that turns against whoever acts or offers resistance. If the practitioner knows how to resist, the force is discharged elsewhere, but in any event it is discharged. The lines of lesser resistance then consist of those people who are connected through a bond of sympathy 
or even of blood with him who acts. I know this from personal experience. This knowledge opened my eyes to a world of new meanings. Evola says that if you know how to resist, that is, if you have a sufficient spiritual virility, which we've talked about elsewhere on this channel, then that force will not blow back on you, but will be essentially deflected off onto something else. However, one way or another, that force will and must be discharged. So if it doesn't discharge onto you, where does it go? And this is where we get into this ethical dilemma. First, that force will try to follow the path of least resistance. It will deflect onto people you have a blood relationship with or people you have a deep emotional connection to. So you may avoid the blowback yourself, but one of your loved ones may then suffer the consequences. Now these lines of resistance become closed off if one has perfect detachment. So again, we see the importance of detachment. You can start to understand one of the reasons why detachment outcomes was of the utmost importance for the castes that were in charge of the rites. You know, they're performing magical operations and they're stirring up big vortexes on the metaphysical plane. They can't be putting their families at risk every time they enter into this realm. So this detachment to personal relationships doesn't mean that you don't love anyone, but that there cannot be any emotional or sentimental clinging to them, any fear of loss. So if you can close off those lines to your loved ones, then where does the discharge occur? Evola says he doesn't know for certain, but he speculates that those reactions will then be displaced onto other predestined beings, such as souls yet to be born. This is certainly interesting to consider. He mentions that he discovered that one can strike deals in this plane to pay with the coin of something of one's physical life in order to gain powers in the supersensible realm. He says it became obvious that one could pay to remove another's sins and take them upon himself, and he posits that this may be the cause of the sufferings of many saints who took the bad karma of others onto themselves as a service to the world, or it could go vice versa, you could take on good things. But in any case, it seems that there must be this balance, and that in order for one person to have good karma, another must have bad. I'll read you the other footnote, the one at the very end of this chapter. A phrase of Swami Vivekananda has struck me in this regard. The prostitute and the prisoner are Christ, who sacrificed himself so that you can be good people. Such is the law of equilibrium. All the robbers and assassins, all the unjust and the most depraved, wicked, and malevolent beings are all my Christ. I profess a religion of Christ gods and Christ demons. I personally find this a very interesting consideration, as it seems to suggest that a person's karma is not necessarily 100% caused by them, but it could be the results of trades made or simply the effects of others' actions. To me, that makes a lot of sense. So the problem, as Evelis sees it, is that if this law of reaction is unavoidable and unbreakable, then everyone who tries to liberate themselves does so at the expense of someone else that someone must be sacrificed in order for you to ascend on the magical path, because as you ascend, you're pushing against all these forces and creating this energetic buildup that must be discharged somewhere. And this is what is meant both by that footnote and also the passage from Gustav Meyrink that he includes about the murderer. He says that through sufficient renunciation, one is freed from the effects, that is, from karma, and this is what the Bhagavad Gita says for those of you who have been following that series. With perfect detachment, acting only in service of dharma, unbound from sense pleasures, one is freed from karma. One can remain standing above all cosmic laws. But is it also possible to void the effects entirely? If you yourself are freed from these effects through your perfect detachment, through your stepping out of the karmic play, do those effects dissipate entirely? Or does that discharge still have to go somewhere? This is the problem Evola is posing with this essay. And it might be a little unsatisfying that he doesn't actually offer an answer. Rather, this is a warning and an ethical question. And neither have I myself ever come across anything approaching an answer. So as Evola has invited his readers to consider this question, I too invite all of you to ponder on this. Feel free to share in the comments your own thoughts, or perhaps you've come across something that addresses this. What do you think? If, given that this is an unavoidable casualty of magical action, how do you feel about it? Could you justify it, or would you feel it was too high a price to pay to buy your liberation with someone else's karma? 
do you think those magical actions, the effects of those actions dissipate somewhere? Does it disintegrate or must it be passed on? I look forward to hearing your ideas.